I'm thinking about this way, I'm thinking. Okay, I think now we can start. Uh, I just want one person to confirm whether uh, they can hear me or and also whether they can see the slides. So I'm just picking Tafazwa. Tafazwa, can you hear me and can you also see my slide? Yes, I can hear you and I can see your slide. Okay, fantastic. Okay. So today we are doing uh, the capital gains tax and I intend to do the introduction here today then and finish uh, the more complicated issues on CGT tomorrow. So preliminarily I am, um, I think CGT will be, I'll be done with CGT tomorrow and then we can go to uh, taxation of companies who will be covering those capital allowances, uh, those allowable deductions for, for, for companies and so forth. Then on another week we will be covering, uh, maybe next week that's when we will finish taxation, we will be covering um, <coughs> um, the taxation of individuals on employment and trade income. Okay, so today we are introducing CGT and then tomorrow we finish it if uh, time permit us. Okay, so uh, the authority for CGT, uh, the capital gains tax is basically uh, the capital gains tax act itself, that's the 
the, the overall authority. And then we can also use case laws, but uh, uh, as far as CGT is concerned, we rarely use case laws. Don't know why my slide, my computer is not responding. Okay. Okay, so we said uh, the authority, this, that's why I, this one is in bold. <clears throat> this is the, the overall authority. Then we can also use case laws where uh, this one does not prescribe a way of treatment of a specific thing in the question or in a, in a situation we can use case laws. Okay, uh, so it's the, the act is called Capital Gains Act Chapter 23.1. Okay, uh, just a quick question before we get into the nitty gritties of the topic. Uh, I just want to do this quiz. We are determining whether the following scenarios uh, leads to a capital gain where we'll be able to calculate capital gains. Okay, so I'm just picking anyone. Uh, so the first one is nitty gritty limited sold a delivery vehicle. I just want to measure your level so that I I see uh, the, the 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 extent or uh, to which I mm, the extent of uh, of my explanations and also I I also know the type of question that I should be asking you. So I just want to see if you know anything on capital gains. So we are starting this um, uh, session uh, this quiz. So the first question is. <clears throat> We examine whether these four situations lead to a capital gain. Okay, so the first one is integrity sold a delivery vehicle for fifty thousand. Um, uh, who is on the call? Uh, there is Ruth. Do you think this transaction will lead to a capital gain? Ruth, 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 can you hear me? Can, do you think uh, scenario number one can lead to a capital gain? Will lead to a capital gain? Need to get sold a delivery vehicle for 50,000? I think they can lead to a capital gain. Why? Um, uh, because it is a specified asset. Okay, okay, okay. And what's the specified asset? Uh, property or a security. Brilliant. Okay. What about the number number two? Nas Limited sold an office block for four hundred thousand. Uh, this time I'm picking. Uh, who is that one? Uh, there is who on the call. There is. Um, I don't know how to pick Tafaz. I want to pick uh, Betty. What do you think about the second scenario? NAS Limited sold an office block for 400,000? Is Betty on the call? Betty? Yes, I am. Yes, so do you think, do you think scenario number two will lead to a capital gain? Because because okay, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, so we'll revisit this slide once we finish um, discussing a little bit about capital gains tax. Okay, so what is capital gains tax? Okay, so in its basic form, we say uh, capital gains tax arises from gains realized from the sale or deemed disposal of a specified asset from a source within Zimbabwe. Okay, so we can only charge tax when gains are realized from the sale or deemed sale, that means there is an actual sale, there, then there are some instances where we have to deem that an asset has been sold. Whenever we deem something, it means the, that thing was actually not there. We are 
like forcing things. Eh? Maybe uh, it's a parent or someone who donated the asset to you or a friend, we have A, we have A here, then we have B here, then uh, A donated maybe an in, um, industrial building to B for free. You know, the donation is for free. So when Zimra looks at that transaction, it will deem that donation is a disposal. So the, the capital, uh, the gross capital amount will explain all these terms will be like uh, the, the market value or the, the market value or the fair value of the asset donated to be. That will be the gross capital amount. We'll explain the gross capital amount later. But that's what we mean by a deemed disposal of a specified asset from a source. This one is important from a source within Zimbabwe. So I remember that uh, that other question was it assignment three. It was saying this individual was not ordinary. He moved to, to a certain country uh, in March. So for tax purposes, he was not ordinarily resident in Zimbabwe. And then they said, what are the tax implications? We do not consider ordinary residents for, uh, for residential status for capital gains purposes. We consider the source here as long as uh, the source or that asset is situated here uh, or the source is here, that means capital gains tax will be charged here in Zimbabwe. Okay. So let us try to define, you heard uh, Ruth, uh, uh, talking about specified assets. Okay. So we say um, capital gains tax is only charged when we sell a specified asset. So it's very crucial that we explain what is a specified asset. Okay, uh, so a specified asset means an immovable property. So one, it should be, it can be an immovable property. So we know that those immovable property, e.g. land, buildings, um, and, and, and then uh, number two, it should be any marketable security, e.g. debentures, uh, share, shares, um, uh, unit trust, bonds, and stock, but it excludes loans. Loans. Loans is not a marketable security. But debenture, you can actually go ahead and buy debenture. Uh, from any listed company, provided they issue the debentures. So it's a marketable security, but loans, they are not marketable security. So we have two things. But was it effective, um, was it effective 2017, this formula was extended? Because initially we used to say, uh, um, a specified asset is only these two, it's either an immovable property or a marketable security. But then in 20, in 2017, something changed. So what actually changed? And that thing was actually tested in that assignment. Okay, so what, um, before we go to the change, uh, we, we, there is a quiz again, which of the following are specified assets and which ones are not? So using the criteria that we, uh, on this slide, we said specified assets are immovable property and marketable securities. Here, that now the question is saying which of the following are specified assets and which ones are not. So uh, this one is immovable property. This one is not a specified asset. This one. This one is not a specified asset. This one is immovable property. Mm. This one are marketable securities, then yeah, what about these ones? That was the question now. That's why I intentionally included these three. Are these specified assets? That was the question. Because on that assignment, these two were included. So the question is, are these specified assets? Because we said specified, specified assets, there are two things on that slide. We said immovable property. Then number two, we said um, we said marketable securities. So the question is, these two cannot be immovable property. No, 
But can they be marketable securities? No, these ones are not marketable securities. So are they not uh, the sale of trademarks? So they will it not lead to a capital gain? Okay. So we go to the extension of the of the specified asset definition. Okay. So with effect from one January twenty seventeen, the definition of a specified asset or specified assets now includes the following. Uh, uh, any right or title to tangible or intangible property registered or required to be registered in terms of we have mines and minerals act so if someone is a certificate or a right to mine somewhere when that certificate is sold it leads to a capital gain because it is required to be registered in terms of this act then the patents act if uh, a company has patents and it happens that it sells it sells those patents it leads to a capital gain because patents are required to be registered in terms of with in terms of uh, the patents act the same applies to trademarks so we go to this question that means trademarks are um, specified assets okay then industrial designs act copyright and uh, neighboring rights act copyrights and neighboring rights act and then geographical indication act then integrated circuit uh, layout designs act i'm sure you won't encounter all these ones but if an asset is required to be registered in terms of these acts in terms of all these acts it is a specified asset so what about the software uh, so can we conclude that the software is not a specified asset um, I, i'm sure uh, the software is um, okay well, uh, let, let me just uh, throw this question to the floor do you think uh, a software is is a specified asset having uh, considered this extension of the capital uh, of this for of the specified asset formula anyone i'm just going to pick one okay so what do you think um mm -hmm. melissa i do do you think um uh, softwares are specified assets Okay, thank you. Uh, who else can we give the platform? Simba. Simba, do you think softwares are specified assets? Why do you think so? Okay. So it depends. Um, uh, now, when you go to the actual industry, you you see that some of the softwares they are actually treated as PPE, like computer softwares. They are actually cleared, treated as PPE. So. Um, when the proper plant and equipment is sold, it is sold together with the software. So the sale of that software is not, it will not lead to a capital gain. So softwares generally, the, 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 the sale of softwares, uh, they actually don't, need, don't lead to capital gains, but it, uh, it depends. Uh, there are those kind of software. What 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 example can I give? But maybe this one uh, you can go and uh, research a little bit. But generally, softwares are not specified assets because most of the times they are part of PPE. But when they are not part of PPE, then how do we treat them? Do we treat them when we sell those type of uh, software? Do we say we have sold a specified asset? 
that is for you to go and um, research and then you tell me the answers tomorrow. Let's go to, we, we saw that from the definition of, uh, um, from the meaning of the capital gains tax, we said uh, from a source within Zimbabwe. So now we are considering that statement from a source within Zimbabwe. What does, what, what does the, this statement mean? Okay, so we are saying CGTA, that means the Capital Gains Tax Act, employs a source-based taxation system. It is founded on the true source principles, which states that only gross capital amount, we explain this one, of the process derived from a source within Zimbabwe is taxable in Zimbabwe. It does not matter whether the person making the disposal is resident or not resident of Zimbabwe. I think I explained about the resident status. It doesn't matter actually whether you are an uh, uh, ordinary resident in the UK. If you sell any asset, any of your assets in Zimbabwe, we charge you the capital gains tax. Therefore, the source of gain on immovable property is where the property is situated. As for the marketable securities, it is the place the investor is conducting his investment activities. So you can uh, look, go ahead and look for this case, the ITC 1395 of 1985. That is, the source of proceeds from self shares is where the seller carries on his investment in or trading activities. Okay. We go to, <clears throat> so the question is, who is liable to pay or remit capital gains tax? So obviously the first one is the seller himself. When you sell your, your, your specified asset, you have to remit the, uh, the, the capital gain to Zimra. But in some instances, when a depositor is involved in the process, the depositor is required to charge or to withhold tax, what we call withholding tax. So the, the, the principal uh, responsibility of depositors are to withhold tax. And we have those rates who we'll dig deep in those rates, but basically for immovable property with what it takes is 15%. For, 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 for unlisted, unlisted shares or market, uh, marketable securities, the uh, with what it takes is 5%. Then for the listed ones, uh, listed shares, the with what it takes is 1% and is final. So basically, uh, listed shares, there are no capital, like we don't charge capital gains tax on listed shares. We only charge the withholding tax. And that withholding tax is final. Okay. So uh, these are the two people that are responsible, or they are, uh, the, those, these are the two people that are liable to pay or remit capital gains to Zimra in Zimbabwe. The seller and the depos depositor. Okay, so the depositor, they include the convincer, the legal practitioner, the estate agent, the building society, sheriff of high court, stock broker. Yeah, you see all these people uh, or these individuals, they are involved in the process of selling your, your specified asset in some way. Maybe you are ordinary resident in the UK and you can't come here and do the transaction yourself. Maybe you can use this dude, okay? Or maybe uh, because there are some legal consequences involved in selling that asset, maybe you can involve the legal a lawyer. That lawyer is liable to withhold the tax. Then. We have also the estate agents. We have, we have those, what do we call those, uh, John Pocock, uh, when they, some uh, individuals, they use those guys because they manage properties. So maybe your property is being managed by John Pocock 
um, then you will sell that um, asset. It is basically John Poco, which is selling the asset on your behalf. So John Poco is um, liable or is, the, is responsible for withholding tax on the sale of that asset. The same applies to building societies, uh, the sheriff of, uh, or master of high court, the stock broker, this one is uh, with regards to shares and marketable securities, okay. With effect from 1 January 2017, the definition of depository now includes the registrars or other registering offices, officials responsible for the registering for registering rights, titles, transfers, or amendments in any of the X mentioned above. So what happens is maybe I do have my asset here, uh, maybe a house. We conclude um, the sale of the house to my friend, then we just want someone to transfer the, the rights from myself to my friend or to change the title deeds. And that responsibility is for these uh, registrars and these uh, registering offices. So these guys, they should withhold tax uh, and remit that tax withheld to Zimra. These officials are now required to withhold capital gains without in tax where they hold any monies in respect of the disposal. So these depositors can only withhold uh, tax when um, we say money is maybe passed through their hands. That's when they can withhold. You can't withhold something that you don't have. You can only withhold something that you have. Okay, I think that one is clear. So what are the rates? I think we have talked about the capital gains in general or the basic definition. Uh, we said these are gains that arise from a sale of a specified asset. Then we, we defined what are specified assets. We said they are, these are movable property and marketable securities and an intangible or tangible asset registered in terms of all uh, these, uh, this list of the, the patents, the minerals, the trademarks, the industrial designs. Okay, now, so what are the rates of capital gains tax? So this one is the most controversial uh, part of CGT now because the rates changed and looks like everything is just happens that there are days uh, we have most, the most crucial days are the, 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 the uh, was it the first of February 2009 uh, then we have uh, the second of February 2019 those are the most important days so what happened on those days uh, we will discuss on those ones but in its basic form where the specified asset being disposed was acquired after the 1st of February 2009. Capital gains tax is chargeable at the rate of 20% of the capital gain. Okay, so if the asset was acquired after that debt, I think that's the dollarization debt, uh, we say capital gains tax is chargeable at the rate of 20% percent of the capital gain. Okay. Where the specified asset being disposed was acquired before the 1st of February 2009, capital gains tax is chargeable at the rate of 5% of gross capital amount realized from the sale. Maybe let me demonstrate this one. I know it's very controversial and on that assignment, it was highly examined. So let me just demonstrate what this whole thing means. We have very important days here. It is happening here, okay. Uh, okay, so that, then what happened on the debt? Then, uh, then, tax co the que this. Okay, 
it's very important that I demonstrate these things because they are really very controversial. And even the textbook, uh, the textbooks themselves, even tapera, it's 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 confusing itself. You can't actually see what what is what. Okay, so the first date that we have is one February two thousand and nine. This is the dollarization date. Dollarization date. That's what happened. Dollarization. Let me just say dollar. Realization. That's what happened. So, what are the tax implications? Uh, CGT on all specified assets acquired before that debt is charged at five percent on the gross capital amount okay i'll also explain what is gross capital amount but in the meantime uh, just know that it's only five percent on the gross capital amount and uh, cgt on all uh, specified assets acquired acquired after that debt is charged at a rate, at a rate of 20% on the capital gain. Okay. That's it for this debt. Then another important debt is um, the the second of February one looks like February is really something else. Twenty nineteen. If you remember well, I think that's where when was it structural instrument? Uh, let's just say start a special instrument of twenty two February twenty nineteen. That, that that instrument said. Um, USD and, and and bond note is at one as to one. That's what happened here. So I want to show you the reason why Zimura ended up saying, okay, so CGT is charging this percent or this percent over this percent. Okay, so what are the tax uh, consequence of this transaction? Pay very, very uh, uh, careful attention to what I'm, I'm about to explain now. Okay, so if the asset, if a specified asset was acquired between uh, 1 Feb 2009 and 22 Feb 2019 and sold uh, and sold um, during the same period. CGT is charged at 20 percent. Looks like there is nothing uh, special there. Okay. What if the asset was acquired during this period? But here, yeah, let's change. It was sold after 22 Feb 1, 2019. So we have the same scenario. The asset was acquired between 1 February 20, 2009 and um, 22 February 2019, the, the asset was acquired or constructed during, or during that period. But now it is being sold after uh, the second, uh, the, 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 the 22 of the 22, after 22 February 2019. So CGT is charged 
eight five percent on the gross capital amount. It's look, it looks like the treatment here is the same as here. Okay, what if if the asset, the specified asset was acquired and sold from 22 Feb 2019? In this case, the CGT rate uh, goes back to 20%. No. This distortion, this whole distortion, that's why that's when students are getting vexed here. So we said uh, for this date, we said what happened, the special thing that happened on the second of February 2009 was the, 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 the dollarization. And then why did then Zimura said uh, or the X said uh, CGD should be charged? At five percent, you see the the problem was now that uh, the, the asset would they have been bought in Zimbabwe in dollars, the, the, those bearer checks. But now because the we had dollarized, the asset was now being sold in in, in USD. Now we know the framework that we say gross capital amount, less exemptions, less recruitment, less deductions. When you say less deductions, we are going to say. Under the deduction, we have the cost of the asset. So the gross capital amount will be in USD, but the cost or any improvements will be in Zimbabwe dollar. And to convert that to USD, the rate was something else. Maybe one USD is to two quadrillion Zimbabwe dollars. So that was not going to work. That's why Zimbra said, or the X said, ah, no, 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 just charge 5% on the gross capital amount. So if this asset was sold for 20,000 USD, you are not going to deduct anything, even the allowable deductions. You are just going to pay 5% of that amount. It was, the, the, the Zimbra was trying to run away from all those complications. That's why they ended up saying, no, the CGT should be charged on the gross capital amount. Okay, then uh, the normal CGT rate is 20%. So if the asset was now uh, uh, bought after the, the, the dollarization, the, the capital gain uh, tax is chargeable at 20%. What about this one? What was the distortion here? When the government said, I think by 22 February, it was clear that USD is not equal to, to bond. Uh, and the rate was starting to like deviate. I think the, the rate started to be different end of January. Or, uh, um, officially, when you go to, 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 to the Arab State website and look for the mid race for 2019, you can see that the rate was one as to one for the whole of January, then end of January, it, it was now maybe one as to two. But then uh, government just woke up and say, no, 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 on that date, it was actually on the sunset. They said, ah, uh -uh, no, Zim dollar and USD is equal. There's no distinction. It's one as to one. So people were now saying, okay, so if I sell, uh, now it was quite clear that if someone was going to sell an asset uh, in USD dollar, maybe in June, they can just say, no, no, no. They'll go to, to, to Zimra and say, no, you say the Zim dollar and USD are, are one, so I'm remitting the capital gain in Zim dollar. We'll go again to that section 39, a subsection nine. I think it was also examined on that one. Uh, it was section thirty nine point A uh, point nine and section thirty nine subsection A subsection ten. That's what happened on this date. So to remove all that distortion and also to the fact that the scenario was almost equal to what happened in February two thousand nine. That now the cost of the asset was in Zim dollar, uh, but 
uh, then uh, the cost of the asset was in both uh, Zim dollar and, and, and USD. So to remove all the distortion, they just say, no, no, no. The CGT is going to be charged 5% on the gross capital amount. No deductions are allowed. They were trying again to run away from the same distortion that they were trying to run away here. Okay. Then, if the specified asset was acquired and sold from 20 February, there are no more distortions here. Uh, I think we of, we're now officially using um, Zim dollar. And then uh, the CGT goes back to 20%. I think this one, you should be very careful on this one. Okay, so that assignment was testing this one, mostly these, these, these things, these changes, and people I know, they were doing something else. Okay, so let me pause and ask if there are any questions on the rates of CGT. Do we have any questions? Mm. I'll take the silence as a no and then move on, okay? So that's it for the rest of CGT. I think uh, these slides are explaining the same. Okay, let's go to that section, section 39A, subsection nine. It provides that it shall not be deemed for the purpose of the Capital Gains Tax Act that all transactions involving the sale or other disposal of a specified asset are in Zimbabwean currency. Rather, where any such transaction results in a capital gain being received by or accruing to or in favor of a person in whole or in part in foreign currency, capital gains tax at the rate specified shall be paid in foreign currency on the capital gain or such portion of it that is equivalent to the portion of the total transaction denominated in foreign currency. I think I explained it as well. That's what we were supposed to write on that question. They said that. Uh, uh, the question was, uh, what, what, the effects of this subsection, what, what? That was what you were supposed to say. This implies that where part of the gain is in foreign currency, only capital gains tax applicable to the capital gain in foreign currency is remitted in foreign currency. The basis of apportionment is the capital gain. Okay, I think I, I explained this one. Uh, let's go to... So there are some disposals where we do not calculate capital gains tax. Um, so this is the list of those uh, disposals. We said transfers of any spe specified assets between spouses. Um, uh, then transfer of principal private residence between former spouses in pursuit of a divorce order. Then transfer disposal of specified asset by a deceased estate, transfer or disposal of principal or private residence by an individual who is or above the age of 55 as at date of sale, disposal of principal or private residence by an individual where all the proceeds are used to acquire or construct a new principal or private residence. We discussed this one in detail. Transfer of business property used for the purpose of trade by an individual to come under his or her control. Where such company will continue to use the property for the purpose of trade, then donation of housing units to a local authority, approved employee share ownership trust or community share ownership trust. This one is, we don't need to explain anything here. Good. Now we are talking. Let's quickly discuss the CGT procedure before our, uh, we are timed out. The recordings are one hour long. So if we reach the one hour threshold, then it will stop us and then record another session. Okay, what is the procedure? So when you are given a question or a scenario, what you do is, okay, now we are talking about the CGT procedure, CGT procedure. What you do, 
This procedure is followed for each and every asset. You don't mix assets. You don't aggregate, you disaggregate them. Okay, so the procedure goes like this. When you are given a question on CGT, you start with the gross capital amount. In its basic form, the gross capital amount is just the selling price. If you sell your building at 100,000, then the 100,000 is the gross capital amount. If you sell it at um, 20,000, then the 20,000 is the gross capital amount. In this case, let's just put uh, these X's to represent any amount. Then we sell, we sell less recoupment. So for those who attended my sessions earlier, they know that recoupment are previous capital allowances granted on an asset that are, are brought back into gross income when that asset is eventually sold. We'll discuss this again in detail, uh, but uh, we deduct recoupment, we also deduct uh, um, exemptions. If we have any exemptions, we'll also talk about exemptions. Okay, so that's what we do. After that, the amount that, uh, okay, the amount that we find here, we call it capital amount. It's no longer gross, it's now the capital amount. Okay, then after calculating the capital amount, we then say less deductions, or you can say allowable deductions. Okay, so what? Do we start with, we start with the cost. Maybe the asset that we are selling at 100,000, we acquired it for 25,000, that's what we put here. Then we charge inflation allowance at 2.5%. At, um, at this is just the rate for inflation allowance. Uh, we put it here. So maybe if we uh, acquired the asset for uh, maybe 25,000 and we acquired it in 20, let's just say in 2018, even in February 2018 or March 2018, then you are selling it in 2021. Year. We are going to say the inflation allowance is 25,000. The cost multiplied by 2.5% the rate, the inflation allowance rate multiplied by the years. So we say 2018, 2019, 2020. We don't consider the months that we use the asset. We just count the whole year. Even the asset, if the asset was acquired on 22 December 2018, we just count the whole year. We just allow the whole year. The sum applies in 2019, the sum applies in 2020, then 2021, when we are now selling the asset, we just count the whole year, even if we sell the asset on 2 January. We just count the whole year. So we say 2018, 2019, 20, 20, 2021. So we are four years here. Yeah. Then the inflation allowance will be 2.5 thousand. That's what uh, that's what what we would put here. Okay, but for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to put the um, the x x axis. Then maybe it was an office building and we did some improvements. So the cost of that improvement, we put it here, it's an allowable reduction, and we also put, uh, we also allow inflation allowance on the, at the same rate, uh, but now this inflation allowance was on the cost. And this one is now on the improvements. Okay, then we put here. After that, maybe when we disposed, we engaged a lawyer. Uh, so we suffered legal costs, or let me just say disposal costs. Put the disposal costs here. Then pay close attention here. We say less capital allowances here, or recoupment. We put the same figure here. We, did, we put it in brackets. We are deducting it from allowable deductions. Because from this cost that we deducted here, this guy was allowed the capital allowance in the past. 
So we should deduct that amount that we allowed to him here. So this value indicated in red and this value shall always be equal. The amount that you put here as a recoupment is the same amount that you are going to put here as capital allowances. But we say it in its basic form, recoupment are capital allowances previously granted on a asset that are brought back into income when the asset is eventually sold. You should uh, be able to recite that, that, uh, that explanation without looking at anything. Okay. Hmm. That's strange. Okay. Okay, so we say this one plus plus this one, then deduct this one. Then we have the amount here, the total deductions. Then we say, uh, then we put it in bracket to, to show that we are uh, deducting here. Then we say this amount minus this one, then this one will be the capital gain before reliefs. Okay, so when you, uh, when you hear us saying capital gain, capital gain, capital gain, we are referring to this amount. That's when we say the, the, proce the process from the sale minus the allowable deduction. So we charge tax on this capital gain. But before we charge tax, sometimes let's say it was a, an individual who sold his pro private property, uh, his PPR, and then he used all the process to buy another PPR. We should grant a relief to him, and we shall explain the relief later, but the relief, um, we should deduct the relief here. I'll show you how a relief is calculated. Then if we had assessed loss from previous periods, assessed losses, then we also deduct it here before we apply the CGT percentage, okay? Then the amount, yeah. The amount that we are going to find here is what we call capital gains. You don't call it capital gains after leaves. You can call it, but uh, it is, we just call it capital gains. Then we apply capital gains tax at 20%, the general rate, then uh, the amount will be that will be the capital gain amount that will be uh, payable to Zimra. But in some instances, maybe a divorce that was involved in the process, that means a certain number, a, a certain amount would have been withheld by the dispositor. So we say less withholding tax at source deduct the amount here from the capital gain, then our, the amount that we are going to find here, we call it uh, capital gain liability, capital gain tax liability. Okay. Okay, that is how you compute, basically how you compute capital gains. Whenever you are given a question, this is how you do it. When you just follow this procedure, you will never go wrong. This is the procedure. It's just like a format. So this, this thing is done for each and every asset. You don't combine the assets. If we, you see that notification. If we sold five assets, you need to do this thing for those five assets separately. I think that one is clear. So uh, uh, we, let's give ourselves five minutes break. We we'll start at uh, the second session at five past. In the meantime, I just want to make sure that I, I, I save the recording.